What should I teach today? Psychology? No. Geography? No. Economics? No. Science? I can think about it. But what I said? Think. That means what to teach? I am trying to think what would be a good subject that would interest me today. Another good interesting example is let's say I take a painting. I show you a painting and I ask you about this painting. What would you say? You would not say there are shades of blue that are used. Green color is not used in this painting. There are lines or strokes. There are circles. There are squares. There are rectangles. No. What you would say? This painting looks about a hill station. This painting looks about a forest area or a jungle scene or whatsoever is the theme. That means you are not just visualizing the colors, the lines, the strokes, the shapes. What you are going is beyond all those and that is what is called as thinking. So in crooks, I can say thinking is a mental process. What kind of mental process? It is a internal mental, mental process and this internal mental process can be inferred from our overt behavior or the outward behavior. For example, let's say you and me sitting and playing a chess of game. Now when there is a chess of uh, a game of chess, uh, there are two players, player A, player B. Now let me assume that I am player B. So what I do is I take five minutes. In this five minutes, I am thinking, what should I move? Now, let's say I moved two steps ahead. You as another player would come to know only when I have moved my player. That means it can be inferred only from my overt behavior. Only once I move my player, you would be able to identify what was going in my mind or what was I thinking and what could be my next probable move. Before that, you cannot. So that means thinking can only be inferred from your outward overt behavior. Now, as I said, when we give meaning to certain things, we are actually thinking. So thinking is beyond a normal mental process and therefore it involves higher order calculations. You are able to manipulate the existing aspects. You are able to analyze the existing aspects and give meaning, reasoning and things beyond what is visualized. And that is what we say is really thinking. Now when I say thinking, what things make this thinking? So what are the building blocks behind the thinking? Thinking relies first of all on knowledge. If I know about something, I can infer that. So let's go back to the topic of painting. If I know that this is a jungle scene, then only I can say this looks like a jungle because that's because of my prior knowledge. The next is mental image. Mental image is what? The imagination you stand by. So it is when something is represented in image or words. So when I say mental image and I say imagine yourself uh, in an ocean. So you would probably think about all water around, deep blue uh, colored water around you. So that's a mental image. Now, similar to mental image, there could be mental, uh, there could be construction of words where you could write a beautiful poem or a story on ocean. So there can be various mental constructs. For example, if I ask you, you are now a teacher in a nursery class. That means you would be imagining yourself sitting and playing nursery rhymes. Uh, you might be uh, visualizing yourself interacting with the small kids and all their uh, laughter jokes. The next is concepts. Now concepts imply the mental representation in a given category. For example, I show you a picture of lion. I ask you what is this? You would say this is not a bird because you have a concept in mind. You have a category. Four-legged animal, walking, it is a animal. It's, it does not have a capability to fly. It's not a bird. 
as simple as that so that means you are defining law n in a certain category but the on the other hand if i ignore law n and i say if it is a parrot you would quickly say yes it is a bird because you put parrot in the same category of the bird so concepts help you to represent your mental image in the categories that you have decided this concepts can be of three types subordinate which is the lowest level when i say dog is an animal it is the lowest level then there is basic which is an intermediate level this is i saw a dog this dog is walking a uh, superordinate is the highest level of information where i say i saw a four legged animal which moves its tail barks a lot what animal it is so then you would say okay yes four legged barking moving the tail resembles to dog so i have a higher level of understanding to identify that creature dog when i directly say i saw a dog i am saying at a basic level superordinate very much further clear where i say um this is uh, a animal with three letters d o g dog so that's a subordinate the lowest level of knowledge what you teach in your under um, under uh, the kindergarten classes right the next is prototype prototype is the best representation of a category what does that mean i bring a small stool now uh, i bring a small stool i can ask you what is that meant for you can say oh this is a stool i can sit on it it's a chair another person can come come and say this is a stool i can use it as table i can put put my coffee mug here so that stool could be utilized as a chair as a table but prototype is its best representation in its best form how would it be utilized and that would be a prototype i take another example i draw certain diagrams here which of these diagram which of these diagrams represent a cup of hot tea so probably you would say the last diagram where i have a a convex shaped cup with a handle and fumes coming out best represent the cup of coffee because it is a perfect prototype so prototype is the best representation in that category although all of them belong to the same category but still this one appears closest to what i am trying to denote it can hold liquid solid since it has coffee it's hot vapor is coming out it has a handle to carry so it's a best representation of what i can say is a cup so under the building blocks of thoughts we have focused on three aspects the first is the basic idea which is knowledge behind every aspect so the one is mental image the second is concepts and the third is prototype now here i take another question so this is based on a little cultural aspect i show you this picture and ask you what it is so most of the americans replied that I, we can see big large fishes um which are bright in color Asians Japanese on the other hand replied that we can see green waters with rocks below so what the idea is there is a little differentiation between the americans and the asians on the basis of analysis of this aquarium so what kind of analysis you do is also governed by your culture that means your culture affects your thought process how you think about certain issues certain aspects is affected by your upbringing by your culture so thought process is defined and governed by these things as well the next is the very first step in thinking involves solving a problem because let's say i give you a sum x plus 2 is equal to 5 calculate the value of x the first thought is how would you solve so this is a problem this would require thinking how would you solve so when i say problem solving it is a goal directed thinking 
I am not talking about maths equations and x, y, z in air. I am seeing this equation, particularly looking to this question and trying to calculate the value of x. So I identify a problem. This is a problem which pertains to algebra, but it is only with one variable. Then I represent this, uh, this problem as a mathematical problem. Then I subset the goals, which is, I set the sub goals, which is finding the value of x, which is unknown. How would I find? I'll take 2 on the other side. So I'll uh, find x is equal to 5 minus 2, which is equal to 3. Now, once I have found this using my sub goals, I would evaluate. How would I evaluate? I'll substitute this x with 3. Now, when I substitute with this, this with 3, it says 3 plus 2 is equal to 5. And the, my LHS and RHS equate left hand side and right hand side become equal. That means I am able to come to the correct solution and I evaluate the outcome. So I rethink and redefine the problems in a certain fashion. Clear? So these are the steps which are required in a problem solving. Now, when you are solving problem, there are certain problems. How would you solve a problem? So these problems we can also say are called as obstacles in problem solving. What are the common obstacles? Three common obstacles. The first is mental set. Mental set means we already have a tendency to have certain steps to solve a problem. That is, as I explained in the same question, x plus 2 is equal to 5. So my step is x is equal to 5 minus 2, which gives me 3. I'm not doing a hit and trial here because that's how my mind has been trained to solve problems like this. That is what is called as a mental set. And that's an obstacle in problem solving because any difficult problem I'm giving, I'll try to start with the same logic that I know. And that would stop my growth that would hinder my growth and therefore this is a problem the second is functional fixedness now functional fixedness means i am fixed for certain things for example i have this pen in hand my idea is this pen is used for writing let's say i'm giving given a pack of chips i'm very hungry i want to eat now because of my functional fixedness i don't have any other equipment what would i do I won't have any other option how to open that bag. So my functional fixedness says that this is a pen. This should you be used exclusively for writing no other purpose. But what would my brain say here? My brain would say, oh no, don't go by such things. Functional fitness is not required here. I'm hungry. I need to feed myself. So what would I do? I'll use this pen to open that packet of chips and then probably have certain chips with me. So this shows that functional fitness is an obstacle to problem solving because my mind is trained to use this as only a pen. I don't think that this has a pointed tip so I can just use it to tear a bag as well. So that indicates functional fitness. The third is motivation. Sometimes it so happens that I know a lot of things, uh, but there is a lack of motivation. Why would I open that bag of chips? Probably some of my friends would bring fresh hot dish for me. I'll have that. So there is lack of motivation. I don't want to open that bag and I don't have, uh, let's say, uh, I, I'm not hungry. Okay. So probably if you give me 10 of those packets, all 10 of those I'll just keep because there is no motivation. I'm not hungry at that point of time. So if there is lack of motivation, I won't solve the problem. The problem is how would I open? I don't have any equipment, but that problem I would not even solve. I would not even bother about if I am not motivated. So what is my motivation here? My motivation is my hunger that drives me to open the bag. The next is reasoning. Now, what is reasoning? Let's say you are there. Yeah, you are there on the railway platform to catch a railway. Now you saw a person running. What you could infer? You could say this person probably is missing the train, has boarded a wrong train, going to the next train, has forgotten the luggage, is trying to bid goodbye to one of the friends. There could be n number of assertions that you could draw. So what do you need to understand? You need to reason why this person is running. And this reasoning could come through three ways. One is deductive reasoning, the second is inductive, and the third is analogies. Deductive reasoning begins with an assumption, and it is always from 
a huge set of population to a particular group of population what does that mean mostly when the people are running on the railways that means they are missing the train or their train is about to leave the station so probably when this person is running this person is running because of the same reason now for the specific case i have taken this as an assumption but note that the assumption that i have taken in the general case is not true I don't know whether it is true or not. I have just assumed it that most people run because they are missing the train. And therefore, this person is also running because this person might be missing the train. But my basic assumption for the whole set of population that I have considered is not true. The next is inductive. Inductive means moving from specific to general. That means this person is losing or is not able to catch the train, is running. Therefore, any other person that I would see on the railway, I would understand that they are probably missing their trains and they are therefore running. So this is an inductive approach. So inductive moves from specific to general. So we understand what is deductive, what is inductive. I take another simple example for deductive. Uh, all cats have four legs. I have four legs. So I am a cat. Now this is a deductive reasoning. My uh, assumption, underlying assumption was not at the accuracy and therefore my final result is not on the accuracy now uh, is the third form of reasoning the third form of reasoning says analogies what is analogy analogy simply means as a is to b similarly c is to d as simple as that that means if i say where do fish live fish live in water therefore where do bird lives bird lives on trees or flies in the air okay so that's how we have analogies as another form of reasoning so all of these three methods help us in solving the problems the next is when we are taking decisions we are making judgments now when we are making judgments sometimes these judgments are automatic i am driving the car there is a red light what i would do i would immediately put the brake this is, no one is saying, red light is coming, stop the car, put the brake, stop the car, put the brake. No, this is a judgment which is auto-generated. So we say judgments can be automatic. Then there could be judgments which are based on your knowledge. So let's say I am evaluating the copies of students. Now this is based on the knowledge. How much mark should I give to uh, the student? And therefore, this is a judgment based on knowledge. The next is, uh, let's say I am seeing a painting. Now, how I make a judgment about this painting is my personal opinion. It's subjective in nature. So, my judgment would vary from your judgment, would vary from third person's judgment and it would be based more on our personal choices, personal preferences. If I am going to a, pers uh, to a painting exhibition, probably I could like paintings which are related to modern art. You could like a painting which is related to classical uh, themes. So there could be various combinations that we can understand, but this would be based extensively on personal preferences. The next important thing is judgment also change with time or with experience. So I can say with time or with experience. I take a very simple example. I am a newly recruited teacher to your school. Now when I am a newly recruited teacher, students at the first round could think, Oh, the teacher who has entered is extremely strict. Probably after a few rounds of discussion, you might feel that, oh, the teacher looks friendly. That means the initial decision has changed over time and with experience. And therefore, we say judgments are prone to changes. And also, decision making differs from problem solving. In decision making, we already are aware about the various solutions. So when I am taking a decision, Let's say I am in an 11th grade now, so I need to understand what college I should go for. So I'm making a decision, I'm not solving a problem. So I know choice A, city A, choice B, city B, choice C, city D, C, choice D, city D. I know which is good, which is bad, which is private, which is public. So here my final answer is based on certain parameters which are underlying. And this is what is decision because I have choices and from those choices, I have to pick one choice. The next is creative thinking. Thinking beyond the box. 
so outside the box thinking we can say i show you a remote here now this remote when i'm showing you here i can ask you how you could use it there could be n number of ways you could say but these are all novel creative unique original ideas so creative thinking focus on novel ideas creative thinking talk about original ideas uniqueness everyone would have a unique suggestion if i ask you how can i decorate this remote i want to decorate and beautify this remote today all of you would have uh, unique ideas some would say you can use cds other would say you can use colors some would say you can use ribbons some would say you can use threads some would say you could use uh, pulses there could be a number of ways through which you could decorate it then is appropriateness how appropriate this idea is to this concept now i take another simple example there is a famous botanist ad carvey now ad carvey actually got the uk's top energy award and that was for devising a unique smokeless chula where sugarcane leaves which were considered useless were turned into fuel so that is smokeless chula turned out to be a very successful innovative idea so these kind of innovative ideas are actually appreciable and part of the creative thinking so galifert defined this creative thinking in two different segments convergent thinking divergent thinking convergent thinking where you have certain limitations that are provided to the thinking so you have certain categories and within those categories you have to say this one is correct divergent is open ended similar to a essay writing or giving you a blank sheet and draw what you want so you would draw whatever comes to your mind and then i would infer what you have drawn similar to the minnesota personality test where uh, i am trying to understand uh what kind of creativity you are trying to bring in here so this divergent thinking actually brings in unlimited aspects or huge number of aspects since it is open ended however convergent thinking is closed ended and therefore from the given aspects you would have to pick one thing again this thinking creative thinking could be of two ways one is everyday creative thinking let's say i want to cook on a daily basis when i'm cooking on a daily basis i would have certain quick things that i would utilize to reduce my workload so it's a everyday creative creative thinking but there could be a specialized creative thinking where uh, it's a festive season i'm trying to paint a wall and this painting of a wall would be a specialized thing that i'm doing just for a while or once in a lifetime the next is in the divergent thinking there are four aspects which are the basis for divergent thinking how fluent you are now when it is writing a essay how fluent you are in your vocabulary if it is drawing a image how fluent you are in putting strokes flexibility is uh, various aspects that you are open to think so if i give you a thread with thread you could draw a painting you could use it for tie and dye so there is a lot of flexibility i give you a thread and i ask you to do something so there can be various things that could be brought originality is something that comes from within yourself uh let's say i saw uh, a a painting made of pulses now i draw a painting made of pulses that's not my original idea but when i saw let's say a painting made of pulses but rather than using pulses i use some other um, innovative stones or other uh, other thermocol balls color those balls in different shade and then use those then probably it's an original idea which i am using elaboration is extension that means i can work with uh, work on new ideas and go into detailing the given concept right so that are uh, those are the four steps or the four aspects of divergent thinking so again remember creative thinking classified by galifert under convergent thinking and divergent thinking divergent is open ended thinking and this open ended thinking could be further classified into four aspects fluency flexibility originality and elaboration 
Coming on next is how do creativity occur? So first of all, you prepare yourself. I want to do this project. Now there is an incubation. Now this incubation is a difficult period. There could be failures. There could be disgust. You have to sail through all of those. You would be feeling like too low at this point that I'm not able to accomplish this task. I am a failure. But then come the feeling of ah. I'm able to do this and this is illumination so illumination is that aha feeling okay and then is finally verification the things that you have done are good or not so you test it you judge it and finally you say that yes this is applicable now again creativity is such a unique aspect that sometimes it so happens that persons or children who belong to different socioeconomic strata or who are deprived children are not able to bring their talents out or their creativity is not revealed because of those barriers so commonly we say there are five barriers that exist the first is the habitual barrier that means we are in certain habit of doing things in certain way so we don't want to change and that brings in a barrier to creativity because we are not open to changes we don't want anything else to happen in our life because we have followed a certain path and we want the life to run in the same way the second is perceptual. Perceptual, that means we are not open to move to new ideas. We want to stick ourselves to only the original ideas. The next is motivational. Motivational means that I am uh, not willing to do it. So there is lack of motivation and that actually uh, stops me from bringing something lack of emotions stop me for from bringing creativity and sometimes there are cultural barriers because there could be certain cultural expectations there are such certain stereotypes certain prejudices that exist within a cultural setting that prevents you certain rituals certain superstitions that prevent you from doing something and since they are preventing you from doing something your creativity is barred from being um, enhanced. So how do we have good strategies for creative thinking? First key point, have good self-confidence. Second key point, be positive. Third key point, be aware of your own defenses that you would be using when you are at a stage of incubation. That means you are failing while you are being creative. So you would be using your own excuses. Oh, I don't want to do this. Probably I'll do something else. So what you are trying to do is you are trying to protect yourself and therefore this becomes a barrier. You visualize what would be the consequence and therefore you don't want to do it. Again, another barrier. Sometimes you give your ideas a chance to incubate uh, and therefore you feel low, you feel disgusted. But good strategy would be to generate ideas, to brainstorm, to discuss with people, bring in more innovative concepts. Think about new things, be original, be sensitive to the feelings of others, engage with others frequently, never accept the first solution that comes to you, try to be more creative, get feedback on solution from others and those are some of the strategies to sail you through the process of creativity. The next important is language and the development of language. Under this, there are two aspects through which we deal with language. The first is language determines your thought, which is known as the linguistic relativity theory. Now, this theory was given by Benjamin Worf and Benjamin Worf said that your language determines your thought process. So based on your language, you would have certain framework in your mind and that would be what would determine your actions. The other concept which is another a different theory given by Piaget says that it is your thought that determine your language. You think in a certain way and therefore you speak certain things. So your language is determined by your thoughts that come into mind. The next is different origin of language and thought. This says, this theory says that language grows independently, thought grows independently. At certain point they come and join. So that means language grows independently at the very first go uh, children are not comfortable they cry but then they cry their cry is their crying is uh, without any distinction but at around a certain age their crying is thought based they would cry loud for a toy they would cry uh, less for sleeping 
or probably um, they know why they are going to cry as simple as that so at certain point that language which is crying for them joins with their thought process which is demanding something and when it joins it gets more um, differentiated so the way in which the child would cry would differ a child crying for a toy or probably for something that the child wants versus just a daily core for sleeping would be very different another way good morning how are you you would say i am fine now here are two functions that overlap one is language when you are saying i am fine but the, but the other is thought process because you are able to respond to my question which is how are you when i'm saying how are you you are thinking about it oh me i am fine okay that means you are bringing your thought into action and your language and thought which had different origins combined and joined here together to give it a single meaning now language in itself has meaning by three things one is symbol the other is rules the third is communication symbol means so any kind of symbology that you see on the road traffic signs could be one of the ways uh, i saw a sign which says this i tell you oh this is a u turn okay so that means you are going through the symbol you are understanding the symbol using the language for the same symbol the next is the rules the rules to organize the flow of thought for example i say i am going to school i don't say school i am going i i go to school am i so there is a rule when i use the word i am plus ing okay so that means so i am that's i so subject plus verb is how the pattern would follow as simple as that so there is a well defined rule of grammar that you would use the next is communication under communication you would include ideas thoughts intentions actions and these would form your ultimate language so the language development is very interesting to develop the language there is a regularity that must happen speaking on a daily basis and a predictable pattern it's not like today i speak a b c d and tomorrow i speak french day after i speak spanish day after i speak german there is no predictability if there is predictability you would learn out of it so how does language development start it starts with the very first thing which is crying the initial crying is undifferentiated as we said with time this crying is thought based associated with how intense the crying would be and how demanding the crying would be the next is babbling babbling is a simple consonant vowel sound so it could be ba ba ma ma da da so it's just a sound creation that occurs usually 6 months to 9 months and then is the one word stage da ba ma and this one word stage becomes repetitive we call as ecolia that means there is a repetitive pattern da da ba ba ma ma so this one stage turns out to be a two stage step quickly and this is because of the ecolia which is the repetitive pattern now after the two stage which is called as the telegraphic speech the one stage is known as holographic speech this becomes repetitive called as ecolia then there is a two stage two two word stage which is known as telegraphic stage and close to the third word a there is a close language development that you can hear now skinner says that language development is governed by behavior that means there is certain association with the things there is imitation and there is reinforcement right so association imitation and reinforcement are the three steps uh, on the side of the bottle i would say this is a bottle on the side of a pen i'll say this is pen that means i'm able to make associations then is imitation my father calls it pen i would call it pen so this is imitating and then is reinforcement that is my father asks what is this i say this is a pen my father smiles hugs me that gives me a reinforcement oh i said correct this is a pen so this becomes a reinforcement right so these are three stages which skinner said behaviorist technically used to understand and help in the development of the language then again the language is 
regional uh, with regional uh, aspects there are variations that occur the last important topic that we would understand is certain concepts for example noam chomsky gave the concept of universal grammar and he took out the concept of innate propositions in the development of language so for him the rate at which the child acquires words or knowledge without being taught cannot be explained only by the learning principles so the rate at which the child acquires the words cannot be explained just by the principles of learning however skinner emphasizes that the words are formed only based on what is learned or what is acquired that means uh, skinner focused on a behaviorist approach clear however chomsky said that the rate at which the child learns is beyond that and therefore the vocabulary is beyond what is being taught and all sorts of sentences could be created according to chomsky uh, children through their words see what is known as a critical period now this is a period where the learning must occur okay and this is an extremely important aspect to keep in mind before uh, going through the length and the breadth of language and language development so in this lecture we basically understood some of the very interesting and fundamental concepts pertaining to language thinking reasoning decision making uh, deductive inductive reasoning talking about the various aspects of thinking creative thinking convergent and divergent creative thinking within divergent thinking we talked about the four aspects of divergent thinking the process of creative thinking from preparation to incubation illumination and verification so those were some of the interesting concepts that we discussed stay tuned for more ncrt uh, lectures on psychology and the complete tutorials on psychology are definitely available on uh, the link below wish you very good luck have a wonderful day ahead